Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, um, all those who invited me. Um, I couldn't believe it when I got to the building and it, and it was called the Cartesian, which makes the geography feel very at home. Um, I am going to be talking about flooding. Um, I, I realised as I was uh, sitting on the train coming down from Hamburg Airport, um, I haven't dwelt hugely much on nature culture um, in the talk, but I'm hoping that's going to be self-evident. Um, but I'm very happy to talk more about that afterwards, uh, as I am um, to uh, respond to questions afterwards. I understand there's recently been, just this afternoon, a seminar with some um, very brave undergraduates. Um, well done is all I can say. Uh, the piece in Theory, Culture and Society isn't necessarily the most accessible thing I've ever written. Um, so I look forward to some challenging questions. Okay, let's kick off. Um, this is actually a German woodcut, um, 16th century woodcut, um, illustrating the topic uh, of the day. And what I want to talk about um, is some general principles uh, around um, how do we better involve people in the research process, those people who are affected by flooding, um, in the actual process of producing um, both flood science, and how we understand flooding, but also interventions that improve the situation in the places where they live. And much of what I'm going to be talking about draws on a particular case study um, in a part of England uh, that those of you who follow cycle touring will be more familiar with than others because um, they passed through Pickering um, in the tour of Yorkshire uh, last year, and I think they're doing it all again um, next month. Um, but it's a part of Yorkshire, which I'll be talking about, but the general principles that I want to discuss are derived from the work um, of Isabel Stengers, and in particular her project of experimental constructivism. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Very happy to talk more um, if that's an area that you want to explore. Those of you who are interested in that dimension, um, I'd also direct your attention to, uh, it's on YouTube now, um, a conversation that went on for a very long time about two hours in the end, um, with, between Isabel Stengers and myself in the Nottingham Contemporary Art Gallery uh, around uh, an exhibition called, not unlike your seminar series here, Nature Cultures. So, I'm going to start from the point of view of some of the things, and I'm sure you've had exactly the same sorts of media and newspaper coverage around flooding events uh, in Germany, and one can replicate this uh, all around the world. Um, but probably the most uppermost in um, the minds of people uh, in the UK, particularly in England, um, were the latest set of very severe floods um, in the early uh, part of 2014. Um, particularly, this is just a map that was produced in one of the Sunday newspapers. So this is a sort of popular representation, if you like, uh, of flood risk and flood-affected areas in, uh, in England. Um, and the area that gained most news coverage um, was down there in the southwest. I got a pointer. I don't know I got a pointer. Um, just under the, the, the most um, westerly of the pink exclamation marks, uh, an area called the Somerset Levels, which is anyway below, water, uh, below the sea line. Um, thinking of your marine uh, enterprises here, but was very severely flooded. And these are the kinds of things, why do these concern people? It's messy, it's smelly. I don't know if ever, any of you have ever lived through flood events in your own hometowns. Uh, messy for a long time, smelly for even longer. Um, but the kinds of things that people start to count, and certainly that governments and the insurance industry counts, um, are the risks to property. How much damage is there going to be? and what's it going to cost to put it right. So all kinds of maps are produced. Um, this is a map of London, and the numbers of properties at risk of flooding, as you can see, they're concentrated around the River Thames, and all kinds of calculations that go on in the uh, insurance industry. The UK being very unusual um, with respect to flood insurance, um, uh, at least until very recently, Flood insurance in the UK was automatically included 
in your household insurance. There's no extra fee or extra cost. Um, that, of course, is all changing now. In the rest of Europe, it's much more common that you have to pay extra for flood insurance. <coughs> this is a picture from the Somerset Levels in January 2014. Probably the most immediate thing that people experience is simply the disruption. This was, uh, you can see a car floating by. This was the only means of getting in and out of uh, a number of settlements and villages uh, by barge, in this case bringing in supplies, uh, bringing out elderly and vulnerable people to come the other way to get them to safety. The kinds of debates going on in the UK press uh, around these uh, localised flood events uh, range from classic sorts of images. This is um, Barack Obama and the, a, number, a pinstripe suited individual, which basically means they work for banking or in the insurance sector. They represent the business community, trying to hold back the evidence from science about the effects of global warming on increasing the frequency and severity of extreme weather events like flooding. We don't want to listen, it costs too much money. So that was one of the discourses uh, going on in the public realm around the 2014 floods. And the other, much more localised, or uh, at least in the national context, pointing out that at the very time uh, when we got more floods, uh, austerity Britain had led to the, a huge reduction in the number of flood risk management experts being employed in various government agencies. So we're actually depriving ourselves of the expertise that we need to manage these floods. These are some of the contextual debates in the uh, popular press. What I want to suggest uh, is that whilst clearly flood events and other kinds of environmental risks and hazards uh, which disrupt lives and as we've seen uh, tragically um, in the fall most recently um, also threaten lives. As well as um, all those very disruptive and negative uh, aspects of these events, they can nevertheless be thought of down the line, not in the immediacy of the event, when we're all focused on trying to improve the situation, but longer term, we can see these kinds of environmental disturbances also as generative, or having a generative dimension. In what sense can we think of them as generative? They're generative in the sense that those in uh, science and technology studies, I'm thinking particularly about the work of people like Isabel Stengers, like uh, Bruno Latour, or Anne-Marie Moll, or Jane Bennett, coming from a very different tradition in the United States, who see these events um, representing as they do an amalgam of natural and social forces that constitute environmental hazards and risks, intensifying the attention that's demanded by what is at issue. In other words, one of the generative ways that these events work is precisely to focus our attention on that amalgam Floods are not straightforwardly natural hazards. It's not just about how much water falls out of the sky. It's about what we've done to the landscape onto which the water falls that makes it move faster or slower, that uh, reduces the porosity of the earth onto which it falls, for example, by concreting over large parts uh, of the world through settlements, and so on. In other words, they're generative in the sense that they fo focus our collective thinking uh, and minds, attention, on the nature of that amalgamation of natural and social forces at play in environmental disturbances of this kind. In that generative sense, then, one of the things that such events do is to force thought. They make the sorts of knowledge by which governments, insurance industries, and other major agencies responsible in some way for the management of flood risk or for calculations about the financial consequences of flood risk. They make the sorts of science that informs those calculations and those investments, usually hidden from view from the wider public, even from those most affected by flood events. They bring to the fore that science base. So 
how is it that insurance industries decide uh, where the riskiest places in terms of giving uh, insurance cover? How is it that governments with limited resources decide where they're going to get most effect for investing in flood defences? So one of the things, the generative effects that these kinds of uh, ontological disturbances can create is that they promote or provoke controversies around that hidden from view uh, knowledge that informs the management of flood risk. They foster the conditions then in which expert environmental knowledge and reasoning is forced to slow down, is opened up to scrutiny. And those affected by the issue at hand, people living in places that get flooded, are motivated to scrutinize that expert reasoning more closely. This is a, an example of a, um, uh, a protest poster we found in Pickering when we first moved, uh, went to work there, which is trying to encourage people to sign up uh, to complain about why it is that government agencies responsible for managing flood risk have not invested in flood defences in this town. So these ontological disturbances then can give rise to knowledge controversies, controversies in which otherwise um, hidden science comes into public view and is subject to great scrutiny. And in turn, that can, if you like, unsettle or open up the arrangements between politicians, expert scientists, and the public at large to give rise to opportunities to redistribute expertise, to draw on the expertise of people actually living with flooding, rather than those remotely involved uh, in examining it in the, in the realms of expert science. Such that those publics sufficiently exercised by the issue at hand, in this case flooding, want to participate in better understanding it. Now that sequence of moves from ontological disturbances through the emergence of knowledge controversies and the creation of opportunities for more kinds of knowledge to be brought into the picture of what, how we understand and intervene in flood risk management can all be thought of as steps that are by no means guaranteed um, often they're not as neatly sequential as that characterization suggests, but can be related to um, a, one of the key ideas uh, for which Isabel Stenger is, is probably best known. This is a quotation from a book that Bruce Braun and I produced on the back of a, a symposium that we brought together, where we specifically wanted to bring science and technology studies scholars together with political theorists to talk about the interface emerging precisely in um, these sorts of environmental hazards and risks uh, that affect human lives, where those two realms of scholarship, we thought, needed to talk more closely together. So what Stenger suggests then in this idea of, uh, of paying attention to the way in which things force thought, and which I think runs through that sequence of the three moves that I've just described, she puts it like this. If we take seriously those non-humans that are best characterized as forcing thought, what we need to think about and address is not the empty generality of humans as thinking beings, but what causes them to think and to object. Humans who affirm that their freedom lies in their refusal to break this attachment, even in the name of some common good. And it's that notion of the things that force thought, and in this case that I'm describing today, flooding forcing thought, that I want to uh, develop through an application. We explicitly tried to develop a methodology. How do you put that idea into research practice? What can you do with it in the world? And um, which brings me to the particular case that I'm going to look at, um, which is being written up in a number of different contexts now. Um, and which is to Pickering, um, <coughs> famous amongst other things, as I indicated, for the uh, Tour de Yorkshire. 
So what was the flood controversy in Pickering when we, we went into the field here in 2007? It's really that long ago, I think it is. So when we uh, entered Pickering, um, there was a great, huge controversy going on around the management, or as many local people saw it, the non-management, the failure to manage flood risk adequately in this town. It's not that flood risk management, this is a town that floods regularly, it is at the foothills of some very beautiful, uh, it's a national park, the Yorkshire Dales, the foothills of steeply rising upland areas that over the centuries have been deforested very largely, although there's still quite a lot of, by English standards, quite a lot of forestry um, up on the top of the hills. Um, but it was deforested extensively in the 18th and 19th centuries um, and indeed water encouraged to move more rapidly off the upland slopes by a series of drainage ditches called grips locally in order um, that farmers could profit from what was then a great boom in the wool industry, the sheep farming. Take away the trees, put in the grips or the drainage dishes, water rushes off, you can intensify the keeping of sheep. So this is a town that floods regularly, um, particularly in the winter, which is a seasonal time in which floods occur, simply because that's the time when there's more rain, but which in 2007, um, experienced some very unseasonal floods in the middle of the summer uh, of devastating uh, levels. And the uh, local environment agency, um, the body in the UK responsible for managing flood risk on the ground, uh, on the back of those uh, floods, commissioned um, uh, an environmental uh, consultancy, the BAPTI group in this case, to review all the possible options for better managing flood risk in this area. And the expert, the solution that they came up with um, that was um, in a public document called the Bounty Report was to build large concrete walls in the middle of the town um, which would hold back the water in times of flood. Amongst many difficulties, um, this is an historic market town, its main industry is tourism, and the centre of town where the wall was going to go is next to England's oldest steam railway, which is a major tourist attraction. And so this was an unpopular solution with many people. But much more importantly, perhaps, it was also a solution that was never going to get built. Pickering is not a large enough town, to think back to that calculation of the properties at risk, um, whereby this was ever going to be a place the Environment Agency nationally deemed uh, would get over the cost-benefit analysis. Investing in this flood wall was not going uh, to improve the flood risk uh, mitigation for enough properties of enough value um, to make this their number one priority for investment. So the expert solution of flood walls was dead in the water. Sorry for that. No, it was unintended. <laughs> because it was never going to be built for cost-benefit reasons. And this is what had given rise to the huge public controversy going on when we entered this, this area. Now the Bounty Report, um, as all um, engineering consultants um, brought in to do these kinds of surveys and reviews of flood risk and the options for management in local areas in the UK, made very fleeting reference to the solutions that they came up with and the possible interventions that they reviewed and their assessment of them and ranking of them in terms of effectiveness as having been based upon the use of a mathematical computer-based model. Nothing more is said. There is no material, no appendix, no annex that tells you anything about it. Well, what were the assumptions in this model? Um, was the model a model used by other flood uh, scientists or hydro hydrological modelers. Was it credible? Um, was it a good model? Was it an indifferent model? Nothing is found out about the model. All we know is that they used a mathematical computer-based model. Not very easy for those affected by flooding and concerned about the lack of an effective uh, management uh, or uh, investment in flood risk management in the town. Nothing for them to interrogate, to get into, to scrutinize. Uh, in any way. 
you know, I gather, some of you in the audience know far more about flood risk modelling than I do. But for those um, for whom, for me, this was, I came at this new, although it was an interdisciplinary project, and we worked with hydrological modellers and so on. But very crudely, that reference in the Babti report makes reference to the primary uh, form of uh, expert knowledge production involved in the assessment and investment in flood risk management. Very roughly speaking, we can see a triangulation in the hydrological modelling practices between the act observations of the actual system, particularly historic observations, self-evidently one uses models when there is no data about a future event. That's the nature, if you're trying to predict events or to forecast the likelihood of flood risk of a particular magnitude, you can't rely on direct observation. You can rely on historic data for previous flood events, and that represents the actual system. That can, the physical properties of a particular a localised system, the slope, the width of channels, the number of streams or rivers, the type of surface that water falls onto, all those kinds of dimensions uh, of the dynamics of flood risk can be modelled mathematically. And indeed that's been going on since um, before the 19th century. A bit that is particular to uh, second half of the 20th century onwards, uh, modelling the third uh, leg in the stool, if you like, of how hydrological modellers work, is that this is all now computerised. Flood modellers, by and large, uh, across the world, use something between five and six different kinds um, of uh, software programmes. These are the only programmes authorised by many of the government agencies responsible for investing um, in the science that informs flood risk management. Most of them are proprietary, that is to say you have to pay uh, to use them, um, one or two are not. Consultants by and large are not innovators in the uh, modelling process. They get data for the area they've been uh, employed to model, they plug that data into uh, the computer program that they're working with, that's been derived elsewhere. They run the numbers multiple times, so-called simulations, uh, and they see what comes out the other end. So this is the primary way in which the science or the expert knowledge that informs flood risk management comes into being. Uh, in other words, this modeling uh, expertise is actually a constitutive dimension of flood alert processes and investment decisions. Without them, there wouldn't be any of those things. So here we are in Pickering, or the Vale of Pickering. Um, you see the dark, it's all quite dark actually on this particular, um, but the dark earth, the really black areas. Um, those are the uplands, top of the uplands, um, North York Moors. Vale of Pickering is a low-lying area, very rich agriculturally, um, with a number of market towns, including Pickering itself, uh, in there. And you can see very roughly um, the movement of water down that series of slopes. So all water moves down the slopes, and just above Pickering, all the streamlets converge, and it gets the maximum volume um, at its door. And when we went there in 2007, we were alerted, pretty much this was the main topic in all the local papers, local anger um, about the lack uh, of investment in flood management, um, this uh, flood wall not being built. So that was the high street in Pickering um, in the June 2007 uh, Summer floods. So what did this flood event, and it was particularly the unseasonality of this flood event, that did the forcing of thought in this particular context? And the key issue that came into scrutiny uh, amongst uh, people who lived in this town and were affected by this prolonged flood event was to problematise, to want to ask the question, have they defined what the problem of flood risk in our place correctly? sensibly, reasonably, or not. Because from what we can see, 
not being able to interrogate the science. Whatever it is that they're doing, it isn't working. So the kinds of questions that we kept hearing repeatedly when we first went into the field, but why do they keep saying it's a one in a hundred year event when we've been flooded twice in five years? It don't seem, the calculations don't seem to be working too well. We're the ones with the experience of flooding. Why aren't the experts interested in what we know? One of the most um, irritating things for local people was that the agency responsible for flood risk management had simply stopped engaging with them because they kept asking difficult questions. So that's the context in which we arrived and wanted to try and conduct an experiment in public science informed by Stenger's notion um, of the way in which things and events like flood risk force thought and to see whether or not we could put her notion uh, of experimental constructivism um, into some kind of research practice, collaborating with local people affected by flooding in this locality. We also worked in another locality, but for the purposes of today, I'm just going to talk about Pickering. So what, was, what is Stenger's experimental constructivism? You can find out much more about it at that um, web link there. Um, it's a collective project, um, uh, interdisciplinary project, based at um, the um, Free University of Belgium in uh, Brussels, um, collaborating with students, staff from different disciplines, and so on. Um, and what the idea uh, takes at its heart are these are a number of things. Of course, I'm simplifying, but I'm, I'm, a highlight, I'm highlighting here three things. First of all, the idea, the project of experimental constructivism indicates, above anything else, a positive interest in what makes a particular construction in all its dimensions take hold. Why was the flood wall the expert solution produced by an environmental consultancy, the Bauti group? Why did that particular construction of the nature of the problem of flood risk and how it was best ameliorated take hold in Pickering? Nothing else ever got discussed. That was it. Once produced by the consultants, this was like a magnet. Anything to do with flood risk management got drawn to the Bauti Group's flood wall. What is it that makes a particular construction take form? Second interest of the project of experimental constructivism is, as the name would suggest, um, in an experimental ethos. That is, an ethos, a way of working, that stresses the conditions and possibilities of subjecting scientific practices and propositions to various forms of public trial. Actually putting expert reasoning and knowledge to the test beyond the usual laboratories and screens in the case I wrote the modeling, uh, to public trial in those places where publics are affected by the kinds of problems being modeled. And this in turn then demands the invention, as she puts it, of apparatuses that enable those most affected by expert reasoning to participate in the construction and indeed the reconstruction of the problem that affects them, in our case, flood risk. And this is where um, this experimental methodology that we try to devise and um, develop, put, put the test in Pickering, comes in. We, we were trying, in essence, to invent an apparatus to follow through this injunction on her part. And in theory, we came up with a rather ugly name for this experimental methodology of competency groups. It derived, I can tell you how, why we stuck with this rather ugly name. Um, uh, we, we derived it from um, uh, a paper that uh, Stainless has written elsewhere. I can say more about that if you're interested. So what in theory did we try to do? What did we set out to try to do? Uh, we set out to try and devise a methodology, a collaborative methodology of investigating flood risk, producing knowledge about flood risk, and proposals for alternative interventions. 
that involves social and natural scientists, on the one hand, in the project team, and those scientists collectively working with flood, effect, with flood affected communities, working together to interrogate and redistribute the expertise that governed the construction of flood risk management in the localities in which we worked. We could specify ahead of time that we thought that to do this effectively would require a commitment from all the participants to respect <coughs> very different kinds of knowledge and modes of reasoning that each member of a competency group brings to the table to the collaboration. And thirdly, we had figured out ahead of time that the usual sorts of ethics protocols, I'm sure your institution is as obsessed <coughs> as ours is with completing your ethics uh, compliance forms before you're allowed to go and do any uh, field research, um, and that those standard ethics compliance um, uh, practices derive from a kind of medical sciences model of the world. That is to say, you, researcher, want to extract something from some innocent party, the research subject, um, bring it back home and do something with it uh, subsequently. And therefore your ethics compliance procedures require that innocent research subject to agree that you can do whatever you like with whatever it is that they extract. <coughs> That's not going to work <laughs> in a collaborative uh, competency group setting where the whole idea is that be you uh, one of the social and natural scientists or be you one of the members of the local community affected by flooding, you all have absolutely equal claim on any knowledge that the, that the, the collective group produces together. So we had to devise our own ethics uh, protocol for everybody to sign. And interestingly, but another story, um, it was some of the scientists who were most wary of allowing local members of the group um, to use some of the knowledge we produced together for their own purposes. But we got into that then. So that's the theory. So the whole point about competency groups in designing a method is not to design the outcome. No idea where this collaboration is going to lead, whether it's going to lead anywhere. It's about the process. It's about creating uh, an atmosphere, collaborative opportunity to produce new knowledge about flooding in this place and potentially come up with new suggestions or propositions for how to intervene and ameliorate the situation. That's the theory. This is the practice. This was the, what it looked like. We met in the building on the right um, and it was flooded when we held our first competence group meeting. This is a picture uh, taken on the bridge. Uh, there were sandbags all around. The building on the right is the Civic Centre. We were on the lower portion of that, um, spending quite a lot of our time looking out to see if the water was rising any further. Um, but this is the practice, being in the place where it happens. And in the very first meeting that we held, so we worked together as a group um, over, in this case, a 15-month period with bi-monthly meetings, all kinds of activities going on in between, um, field visits, video recording, um, all kinds of measurements and other things. But in the very first meeting, I think we gained uh, a strong sense of some of the issues uh, locally. The trouble with experts. This is MP, one of the local members of the group. Every time we get the floods, we get the meeting with the EA, the Environment Agency. And they come along and somebody sits at the front and, oh, we won't do any dredging because this, that, and the other. You've got to hear a, a Yorkshire disparaging accent at this point. I can't do Yorkshire. <laughs> and you sit there as a layman, and you probably notice I tend to ask a lot of questions. I never have the answers. And I think to myself, why doesn't dredging affect it? Because just thinking about it from a simple plumbing point of view, and he then goes into an analogy with drain pipes, it doesn't tie in with what these people say. And yet as a non-scientist, as a layman, I just sit there and think, this is an expert. How do you argue with that? 
And indeed, in our group, where some of the members of the group from uh, the university uh, membership were hydrological modelers, were the experts, we had to spend quite a lot of effort and time trying to find a way of working together. One of the first things we came up against was a complete clash of vocabularies. So here's, I'll just take one of these examples, and it's MP's gutter analogy. So we started by trying to find a way of communicating. You think about a gutter, says MP, how much can go through it? And if it fills up, it comes over the top. So if you've got half the size of gutter, he's talking about leaves accumulating and all kinds of detritus getting in your gutter, reducing the, the width and the depth of it. So if you've got half the size of a gutter, it comes over the top more quickly. Well, to hydrological modelers, the principle of volume conservation for an incompressible fluid represents the same thing. And we could go on. Our solution that we developed in uh, trying to work together was to put much more onus, or as much onus, not on vocabulary, not on the things that we could say to one another, but on working with things, trying things out together um, as a means of learning. Actually thinking with the materials that make us think, that prompt thought. This is a picture of possibly the first or second competency group. So we're now inside that building that you saw with the flooding outside. It looks like a tea break. Um, and in essence, what we did um, was, uh, as, as a group, as a whole, to put diverse knowledge claims to the test. Knowledge claims produced by experts. So how, how did they come up? What was the science that informed the idea of a flood wall on which the town could become? <coughs> Ideas that local members of the group who actually experienced flooding here came up with as what might make a difference. And we did, we put those diverse knowledge claims to the test by working them through various intermediaries. If language was going to be a little bit of a tricky bit, um, what kinds of materials could we work that through? Maps, computer models themselves, photo and video images, instrumentation out in the landscape like rain gauges and so on, all became part of our working practice. I'm just going to take you through a few of them. So we begin with the expert map of the 2007 summer flood event. But the map's wrong. It's about the first thing that people who live in this place, who join the group, had to say to us. And we took several meetings uh, to get people comfortable with the idea that they could interrogate the experts, that they could say, oh, well, they say it flooded there, well, it didn't. They say it didn't flood over there, and it did. Uh, we were there. Um, we saw what was happening. We got started to get, so they started to correct the official uh, flood map. We started to get all kinds of um, first-hand uh, observation, the sequences, timings, where flood, floods first, if here floods, you can guarantee that over there is going to flood because of the connection between those two points. The beginnings, if you like, uh, of confidence in articulating local observation and experiential knowledge. We tried out all the pet theories that local members of the group brought with them, most notably dredging, which was the most popular idea locally as to what would completely get rid of the flood problem in Pickering. Drain the whole of the river, dredge it right down from the bottom of the escarpment from the moors down to the sea, scrape about three foot out, problem gone. No, nothing, nothing will be left, nobody will be harmed. What a fantastic idea. It's only the wildlife that's gonna hold us back. Why are we prioritizing wildlife over local people and their properties? So we tried that dredging. Uh, by this time, we were using uh, just a, a, a graphic user interface to try and get people to be able to picture this catchment. And we tried out the expert view. We tried out everybody's pet theories, including dredging. 
And although it looks a bit like a Sarah Palin uh, viewfinder for targeting something, we were using enabling people to try out, okay, what if we put intervention X or Y in this location or that location? How does that alter the way in which the water moves across this landscape and hence the propensity for this town to flood? And we included in, in our trials there uh, dredging. And one of the most important things that um, we all learned through this process as well as simulating different kinds of interventions and what sorts of impacts they might have on the hydrological landscape. Um, we got to understand, and indeed, dredging did have a marginal effect. Um, however, what we learned alongside that is that uh, dredging did indeed make it uh, better for the particular house of the person most in favour of dredging before the group met. Unfortunately, uh, it displaced the worst of those effects on people currently unaffected by flooding further down in the town. And seeing those displacement effects was as educational for all of us as seeing uh, the results of trying out our own ideas through this uh, graphic replay. So dredging, kind of yes, um, but equally no. Until uh, one of the uh, local members of the group um, came up with what, retrospectively, we all saw as a game changer. Don't we need to stop the water higher up, was their question. <laughs> Why are we all fixated on looking at intervening in the town? Wouldn't it be sensible to do something up there where the water comes from? And so we turned our attention to upstream, so-called upstream storage, storage solutions. So if all this stuff was rushing off these uplands, these uh, deforested slopes, part of the problem of flooding in Pickering was their convergence with nothing blocking them at just outside Pickering, and hence the propensity of Pickering to flood. Having come up with this idea and explored it through the same um, graphic user interface uh, models of this locality using local information as well as remotely sensitive information. Um, the group felt confident enough to go public. One of the conditions that local members of the group had made when they uh, joined up was that we weren't just going to have a nice, however informative, series of discussions between uh, the university members of the group and local members of the group. They actually wanted to make an intervention in the public debate locally. That was their price for working with us for 12 months, or as it turned out, 15. To go public, we had to invent a name for ourselves. Competency group really doesn't do well um, in the public domain. It's a rather academic sort of term. So we decided we'd call ourselves the Rydale Flood Research Group, Rydale being the River Valley the all principal river valley in which Pickering sits. Having done any number of simulations in which upstream storage looked as if, for quite modest costs, it had at least as great uh, a potential impact on ameliorating flood risk as had the expert proposal of a flood wall, we started to put together a public exhibition to take this proposition into the public realm. And we held a public exhibition in that same civic centre, indeed in the rooms in which we had been meeting over this series of months as a group, in October 2008, a little over um, a year since we had started working together. And in that exhibition we wanted to publicise this upland storage proposition. But we also wanted to publicise the working methods that had enabled us as a group of collaborators between university members and local members of the group uh, to work together and produce this proposition, what have been our working methods, how have we produced the knowledge claims that led to that proposition, and also to, remember, to enable people who came to the exhibition to try out the uh, graphic user interface for themselves, to try out some of their own ideas. The exhibition uh, attracted a very large number of people um, the members of the Environment Agency local, locally and others also came. Uh, they kept quite a low profile. 
they weren't very popular um, in the public domain at that point. Um, we had um, a sequence of posters that tried to explain our working methods. We had a series of screens that people could try out um, the flood model, um, the upstream storage model for themselves. You could plug in your own address, see what difference this made to the movement of water and how it might affect you. And there were a number of um, other forms of flood modelling taking place, uh, most notably a physical form of flood modelling, uh, produced to entertain children, though as you can see in this um, picture here, uh, it seemed to entertain the adults uh, rather more than the children. Um, so this was using um, old bottles and um, small uh, paddling rings to demonstrate the same principles um, of hydrological movement of water and some of the principles that we've been looking at in our studies. We've got a lot of press coverage, television, radio, and uh, local newspapers. Um, and the, the proposition that the uh, Rideau Flood Research Group put into the public domain of upstream storage being uh, a, potential, a potentially useful intervention started to gain traction. The Gazette and Herald is one of the local papers. Uh, another, which, uh, as you know, when you put anything into the public domain, you lose all control um, over the words used. So having worked very hard for 15 months not to have ourselves thought of as boffins, the Morton and Pickering Mercury uh, rapidly reverted to caricature, uh, and they wrote that a team of top university boffins and local residents had come up with new solutions to the flooding and Pickering. They suggested a series of buns, or mini dams, be built on the moors north of the town to hold back water at times of flood. But what was interesting to all of us was that there was quite as much media interest, um, not just in uh, this potential intervention that might ameliorate flooding in the locality, but in the very curious notion that boffins might work with local residents. This was um, also got just as much attention. So it started to travel, it's still traveling now. It started to affect the way in which various of the flood risk management agencies in the UK uh, invest in flood risk. Our proposition has now been put to the official test um, in a, what's called a demonstration project from the Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. And this whole approach to flood risk management has now been re, uh, uh, renamed as the whole catchment approach, or um, worse from our point of view, uh, natural flood risk management, which is ironic. So what's left behind? What can we say about this project and this attempt, if you like, to put some of Stenger's ideas into research practice? <coughs> Bruno Latour redirects our attention in trying to evaluate research events um, from some of the usual questions, perhaps, in the social sciences, sciences that we ask ourselves. The question he suggests that we have to ask ourselves is not whether we have accurately represented some pre-existing phenomenon or entity, but whether there is a distance between the contents of the world before and after the inquiry a repertoire of actions now, and the repertoire with which we started. I want to make two observations about this particular experimental project. First of all, I, th I think we can say a, a little about the way in which the competency group methodology has itself travelled. We're currently in the process of producing a web-based toolkit such that other communities can apply it uh, and put it to use in relation to other local knowledge controversies, whether about uh, flood management or other kinds of environmental risk. Um, the name of the game in the UK at the moment, for those of you familiar with research assessment exercises, is impact. Uh, and so um, in packaging this up, we hope to magnify that impact, the impact we have in Pickering. We've also just begun a large project in the Thames catchment in the south of England on drought where uh, an element of that pro project will also involve the use of competency groups with communities affected by drought. But much more importantly than the way in which the methodology has travelled within academic uh, and public circles, 
is that the upland storage solution has now received funding and is, has been built. On the left, you can see the woody debris dams, which was one part of the proposition. Many of these, quite small scale, look a bit like beaver dams in the upland parts of the catchment. Um, and the final element, not yet complete, is a, a, a large earth bun outside, immediately outside the town, um, which when it's fully completed, will be landscaped um, into the landscape. Uh, I'll close by the difficult um, the dilemma that we now face, which is that, of course, a very, very small part of us now needs a flood to test whether these interventions have made a difference, but it is only a very, very small part of us. 